episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Uh, welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show with another fascinating guest who is truly involved in creating a better tomorrow for all of us. Uh, today, we will be focusing uh, on the uh, intersecting themes of, of aging, uh, DNA repair, and cancer. Uh, we have the honor today uh, of being joined by Dr. Vera Gorbanova, who is the Doris Johns Cherry Professor in the Department of Biology and co-director of the Rochester Aging Research Center at the University of Rochester. Uh, Dr. Gorbanova's research is focused on understanding the mechanisms of longevity and genome stability and on the studies of exceptionally long-lived animals. Uh, Dr. Gorbanova earned her bachelor's degree at St. Petersburg State University in Russia, her PhD at the Wiseman Institute of Science in Israel, and she's been instrumental in pioneering the comparative biology approach to study aging and, and identifying a variety of rules uh, that help control the evolution of different tumor suppressor mechanisms, depending on different species, uh, their lifespan, and their body mass. Uh, she also investigates the role of sirtuin proteins in maintaining genome stability. Uh, more recently, the focus of research has been on the longest-lived rodent species, namely the naked mole rat and the blind mole rat, uh, where she's identified high molecular weight hyaluronic uh, as a key mediator of cancer resistance in this species. Uh, her work has received numerous awards uh, from the Ellison Medical Foundation, the Glenn Foundation, the American Federation for Aging Research, and from the National Institutes of Health. Uh, her work has been awarded the uh, Cosarelli Prize for Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, a uh, prize for research on aging uh, for from ADPS Alliance, France, and the Prince Itachi Prize in Comparative Oncology in Japan, and the Davy Prize from the Lamont Cancer Center. Uh, Dr. Gubinova, thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us for a little while. You're very welcome. It's, it's great having you. Uh, I'm, I'm really uh, glad we finally had the time to get together. And um, I, I typically, uh, I start things off by, by handing our guests the floor just for a little bit to talk about themselves. You could just uh, take us uh, for a few moments into your background, a little bit of how you got interested uh, in biology, uh, in, in aging in general, and, and a little bit of your path to date uh, throughout sort of the longevity cancer biotech system. I think that'd be a great way to start things off. Well, I was interested in science since I don't remember when, <laughs> because my parents are also scientists, but not biologists. Uh, and I wanted to do science and I started by just uh, loving animals and I wanted to do something about animals. Uh, but then this interest kind of evolved into uh, more being focused on mechanisms of how things work. And probably my first fascination was with brain function. Uh, but when I tried to specialize the, in that area, and that was a long time ago, and uh, somehow the techniques were not quite there, and I was disappointed. So then there was a period of time I was looking for something else to focus on. I was very fascinated by genetics, and maybe my interest in DNA repair came from that. But uh, just genetics alone wasn't exciting enough, so I really wanted to tackle a big problem, and that's when aging came about. Uh, there was a guest lecture when I was still an undergrad, there was a guest scientist, and he talked about aging, senescence, and I got so fascinated by that, and I decided this is what I want to do. <laughs> so it was like, you know, this moment. I knew this is what I want to do, and then I, you know, looked uh, very, I was very focused on finding mentors in that area for my postdoctoral studies. And that was it. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, if you would, could you take us uh, on, on a little bit of a, a walkthrough of your current model as we're here in 2020 of aging and, and, and specifically this um, what we'll call this triad of uh, mutation events, uh, genomic st instability, and then we'll call aging, whether that's senescence or inflammation or some other function that ultimately causes some problems for us, but then obviously cycles back around to cause more mutations and more instability and so forth. Walk us through a little bit of that, if you would, as a, as a place to start. 
Well, so of course I wanted to understand why aging happens, like what, what's the driver of it. And, um, you know, just simple thinking that uh, molecules get damaged. So there is molecular damage that occurs. And then uh, many types of this damage are reversible. Let's say if a protein is damaged, it usually can be recycled. Well, there are some cases when it's difficult, like in neurons and we get neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, but in majority of cells, damaged protein is no big deal. Uh, but DNA is a completely different story. When it is damaged and then a mutation is created, then yeah, you're stuck with it. <laughs> uh, and then even the second layer, epigenome. So how is DNA packaged within the nucleus? So that also gets unraveled. As we get older, there are all these cycles of DNA replicating, transcribing, and every time it needs to be put back together. And eventually it's not folded the same way anymore. Uh, and it's very difficult to bring it back. Uh, so this really, this type of thinking brought me to uh, really focusing on genome and epigenome stability in relation to aging. You've been, uh, you know, very, as you mentioned at the beginning, sort of very um, instrumental in, in, in the principle of, uh, you know, comparative biology, looking at different species and understanding sort of what govern, you know, why a mouse may live for only a couple of years, but we have this, uh, this naked mole rat that lives for decades. Um, you, you know, you study the short and the long-lived species in the case of the uh, the mole rat, you've, you know, identified some of this um, hyaluronin um, biology. Uh, yet when we look at something like, uh, you know, elephants and cancer, a totally different thing. We have all these copies of P53 and lots of other <laughs> uh, similar dynamics that, uh, you know, we see throughout the biologic kingdom. Um, Talk a little bit about your work, if you would, in general, in, in looking up these different species as you study aging and lab. And then, you know, um, are there any sort of sort of interesting similarities that that pop up between, um, I guess, disparate organisms or, or is sort of evolution sort of thrown <laughs> a bunch of random uh, benefits at, at some of these uh, these different organisms? Well, looking at different organisms, I find it most fascinating because uh, that's where you find new things. I think biology went through stages when yeah, at first everyone focused on the simplest organism like a yeast cell. Uh, and uh, we learned a lot, but I think at this point, somehow you, know, <laughs> you already know everything yeah. uh, you need to know. Uh, and still yeast cell is not a human. Right. Uh, especially in terms of aging, humans are very long-lived uh, creatures compared to most model organisms because model organisms were chosen for their very short lifespan and uh, a high rate of cell division and proliferation. Uh, so we are different. If we want to understand something about human lifespan, we really at some point we need to switch to things that live for a long time because mm -hmm. those short-lived creatures may just be missing uh, those important mechanisms. Like, why, why would they have them? <laughs> they live short. Uh, so this is really why I decided to study long-lived animals. Uh, and there was also a lot of research done with model organisms trying to apply different genetic tools to them and make them live longer. Uh, so let's say you take uh, C. elegans, you make it live twice as long. <laughs> uh, but with C. elegans, it may work. Actually, it's, it, somehow it's easy to manipulate simple creatures, mm. uh, but with mammals, it becomes much more difficult. If you have a mouse, you try to manipulate it, well, maybe you can make it live, you know, 10, 20 percent longer, you know, maybe 30 if you really, <laughs> if you really try hard. Uh, but you cannot make a mouse live 10 years. Uh, but if you look in nature, you can easily find other animals, even other rodents that live 10 times longer. So this is uh, really what fascinates me. 
to understand how those long-lived mammals are different from short-lived mammals because we cannot easily take mouse and make it live 10 times longer and no one succeeded in doing that because mice may not even have in them what's required for such long lifespan we can only look at long-lived species and there we learn about it um, so now in terms of uh, different strategies versus uh, conserved strategies. I think there are both operating. Uh, DNA repair, that looks like a conserved strategy. When we look at long-lived species, at least mammals, and I'm just you know, staying within mammals with sure, sure. because there are all different forms of life that may use entirely different strategies. But within mammals, we find very good correlation between DNA repair efficiency and maximum lifespan. Uh, but then on top of that, every species also, you know, excels in something different um, because the mechanism doesn't have to be conserved to be of interest to us. Okay. For example, we find this high molecular weight hyaluronin in the naked morad may be very useful to humans. People uh, use it. There are many medical applications for it already, even, even without life extension. It's very useful. Uh, so, but it's not conserved, but still, because we are not that different from naked morals, we still have some sure. the same signaling pathways that may be fine-tuned different uh, using those adaptations. And there are many other strategies. You mentioned elephants, yeah, they uh, duplicate their P53 genes and that helps them avoid cancer. Again, you know, maybe I'm not suggesting we should be duplicating our P53 genes because right. there may be problems associated with it. But again, you know, this is an interesting strategy, something uh, to look into. And then there are whales that even bigger than elephants, they don't duplicate their P53 genes. They do something different. Again, something we would like to uh, maybe learn from them and see how we can implement it within human biology. Uh, so I think uh, really we have to use whatever is available, conserved and different mechanisms and see how they can be applied. You know, uh, one thing, you know, when I, when I look through, I mean, it, when I look through the hundreds of, of, uh, of papers that you've published, um, one of the uh, really interesting things, you know, is that when you move beyond sort of the, the cell uh, and, and sort of the ecosystem of, of mutation, genome instability, and, and aging, you have uh, uniquely focused on a lot of the other stuff going on, what well, I'll call the microenvironment uh, beyond the cell. And there's a few of these that I, I just find fascinating. And I'd, I'd love if you just sort of give us some of the top lines on, uh, on what you did here and then sort of your, your thinking in terms of whether there are more interventions at this level than as you were saying, tweaking the genome. And one of these, um, uh, one of the omics areas that we don't hear too much about uh, compared to the genome or the epigenome uh, is something called the lipidome. Uh, and you wrote a paper a few years ago called Lipidome Determinants of Maximal Lifespan in Mammals. Uh, we don't normally think of lipids too much uh, compared to of the other omics, but uh, talk about some of the interesting uh, things that you found out with regard to uh, lipids and the relation to a mammalian lifespan? Well, there were certain unique features that were uh, found in longer lived species, but overall the picture was complex. So um, it's difficult to just say, oh, sure. well, you know, you have to have this lipid and you know, that will help you live lo longer. Right. But it looks like at multiple levels, uh, proteins, lipids, uh, um, DNA, RNA, so there are certain adaptations that may be correlating with longer lifespan or metabolome, yeah, we missed that one, there are right. metabolites that uh, also may be unique, uh, and that's actually some, what's nice about metabolites that um, they are easy to administer, right? Sure. So find certain signatures that are beneficial, you know, you may just easily take a pill, Again, you know, it's not so easy when you try doing that and you need optimal uh, delivery schedules. But um, this is really where omics is moving right now. And it's, it, it, it's essential here to look at multiple species because, yeah, if, we want, if you only do comparisons, be, you know, between this mouse and that mouse, yeah. <laughs> it may not really translate to human biology. 
Uh, we have to really use the entire uh, best theory <laughs> of long and short-lived species and primates and non-primates uh, to get the complete picture. What about the ionome? That was another term that I came across in one of your papers. Uh, makes sense in terms of what it, <laughs> it, it, it's nomenclature. Uh, any interesting, uh, you have this organization of mammalian ionome according to organ origin, lineage, gestation, and uh, longevity. Uh, any interesting things stand out there? Uh, well, that study was, you know, mostly spearheaded my, my collaborator, right. Vadim Gladyshev. Sure. So he could probably comment much better on that. But again, yeah, there are unique ions uh, that seem to correlate with longer lifespans. And that is also fascinating. <laughs> we actually continuing that. So now we have a large array of um, you know, different species and tissues. So we, uh, you know, this is all to be continued and refined. As a, as is biotech. <laughs> what um, you, you've had, uh, you know, a lot of very interesting, as you're mentioning, um, a lot of good collaborations in terms of the Gladyshev Lab and, and, and others. Um, any big uh, projects coming up? Any new collaborations, uh, uh, new initiatives now that we're getting out of this uh, tw horrible year of 2020? Obviously, everything has slowed down for everybody, but uh, anything big coming up in 2021 that you can talk about in terms of new directions? Uh, well, new we work in multiple directions. Well, we continue comparative biology studies. Uh, we want to understand how DNA repair is regulated and also uh, not only genome stability, but also epigenome stability. So this is really my not so new focus. We've been focusing on it for a long time because sirtuin 6 it works in both. It mediates DNA repair and it also takes care of the epigenome. Uh, so we are collaborating on that project with Vadim Gladyshev, Jan Weichlaub, uh, Andre Siluanov's loves. Uh, then there is another fascinating project on the role of uh, transposons in aging. Okay. Yeah, so we, that was actually very fruitful. Um, we published a year ago that transposons may be another driver of aging and still connected to epigenome, but these are like parasites mm -hmm. within us. Half of our genome is made of transposons. And as we get older, Epigenome loosens up and transposons also just uh, awaken and they start, you know, making trouble, uh, which is genomic instability may be, may be, you know, a lesser part of the trouble, but the biggest trouble is inflammation because transposons drive inflammation and the many age-related diseases are connected to inflammation. So we are going to continue that. And then another new interest of mine is on reprogramming uh, okay. because there were beautiful papers published on partial reprogramming and rejuvenation from Belmont Labs, Serrano Labs, uh, David Sinclair most recently with the eye. Uh, so this topic is really fascinating to me, especially as we see connections between CERT6 and um, epigenome, transposons epigenome and rejuvenation. So we're going to pursue those directions. Have you, um, it's, it's a very interesting topic to me personally. Um, the, uh, have you, based on your, um, obviously interest in, in genome disability and cancer, uh, a lot of work was done, I guess in sort of the mid 20th century on um, sort of in the early days of, <laughs> before we actually knew what was going on, but a lot of the uh, reprogramming of cancer uh, mm -hmm. that uh, non so other species like uh, flatworms and amphibians and so forth are very good at. You know, they're very good at getting cancer, but turning it into normal tissue via what we're learning now in, in 2020, uh, same reprogramming mechanisms. Any interesting things in terms of reprogramming uh, and cancer and sort of turning off the epigenome and normalizing uh, cancer? Well, th this is a difficult topic. Yeah, I think that, you know, with cancer, again, there are so many different types. And sure. um, 
and it may be difficult to find one treatment that works on all types of cancer. But what's common between many cancer types that uh, cells kind of reprogram themselves, but not in the right direction. Right. Uh, yeah. They acquire certain pluripotent and embryonic features, but at the same time they lose control and they start just dividing for the sake of themselves uh, instead of obeying commands from the organism. So this is the problem. And th this is also a big challenge in all those rejuvenation therapies because um, you want to reprogram, but you, you want to end up with a good cell, not a cancerous cell. So that's why uh, I think there is a lot of work that needs to be done to ensure safe reprogramming protocols that it doesn't lead to cancer. And transposons may play some role in it. That's something we're going to study. Um, so we collaborate with John Sedevi's group on transposons and another you know, new fascination of mine is with epigenetic clocks. Okay. And so we collaborated with Steve Horvath. He mm -hmm. uh, invented those clocks that I think revolutionized um, the way we measure aging. Now, we don't need necessarily to run the entire lifespan of the mouse. We could um, uh, administer the treatment short term and then just measure epigenetic age. So this is mm -hmm. really fascinating. And of course, there, there are also deeper mechanisms, like why epigenetic clock even reflect aging. So again, that points back to epigenome being so important. You know, it's, it's speaking of collaborations, I, I, um, I spent some time um, uh, with Andre uh, Goodkoff uh, several months ago regarding his, um, his sled dog uh, <laughs> project and the retro transposons and all that. Um, I know you get to hang out with uh, naked mole rats, but do you get to hang out with the the, the puppies at all? I, not that they're they're you know nothing wrong with the naked mole rats, but any uh, you get are you involved in that project uh, much at all? Well, we collaborate with right. Andre Goodkoff, so he uh, helped us really with the transposon paper and uh, gave some really important ideas. Um, the dog project was sort of a follow-up. So, well, I love dogs, but <laughs> we don't, we are not directly involved in that. But I think it's a, it's a very brilliant idea to test the interventions on dogs because dogs are, you know, they're better than mice in many ways <laughs> because at least they live a little bit longer, um, a little bit. Uh, and in terms of uh, you know, the lifestyle and care they receive, it's different. It's, they're not kept in, you know, by very own cages. And so I think whatever they find using dogs will be more relatable to humans. Got it. Got it. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I like dogs. I, I, but not as, <laughs> I like birds, but there's nothing to, uh, Well, dogs, you know, they, um, I find them to be short-lived <laughs> for, for their size. Got it, got it for what you're doing. <laughs> so of course, we want to make them live longer and the people, uh, you know, when their pets are getting old, everybody is, is, you know, becomes very interested in extending dog lifespan because yeah, it's so much shorter than human lifespan. And they also develop so much faster. If you take a puppy and within, you know, five months, it's fully grown. <laughs> Compare it to human baby. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's it's been great, you know, listening to you and uh, and everything you have going on. Um, typically, uh, as we wrap up the show, um, I, I give the uh, the mic back to our guests just to, um, to to mention some of the folks that uh, obviously you have a a lot of people at your lab and a lot of different collaborators. If you want to. Uh, Take time to shout out to uh, any other important people that we didn't mention um, in your lab or, or or outside of it, please. Uh, I, I know it's a, the whole longevity biotech space is quite inconnect, interconnected nowadays, but uh, important uh, folks that you're working with are going to be working with that you, we haven't had a chance to mention. Please uh, take the opportunity to, uh, to shout well, out. Well, I think I mentioned many of my collaborators. I think this whole field of aging and longevity research is, you know, just there are so many bright people. Uh, so I, I, I'm enjoying interacting with them and doing what we're doing. 
Um, so yeah, I, I think there are, there is a lot going on and I hope there will be new interventions coming up soon from different, different directions. Um, so yeah, I think there are reasons to be optimistic. That's good. Uh, especially coming from you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for everybody that's going to be uh, watching this episode or listening on the podcast, uh, you've been listening to Dr. Vera Gorbanova, Doris Johns, Cherry Professor in the Department of Biology and co-director of the Rochester Aging Research Center at University of Rochester. Uh, Vera, thank you for, for taking the time out of your schedule to talk to us for a little while today. And thank you for for all the amazing work that you've done and you continue to do. Uh, and as we say, uh, thank you for helping to create a better tomorrow, especially on this uh, aging and longevity uh, front because it is so <laughs> uh, important and, and, and needed by all of us. But uh, uh, it, was a, it was a great time seeing you and, and, and thanks for, for spending the time with us. Well, it was a pleasure talking to you and I wish you, you know, be healthy, <laughs> happy, and live for a long time. Especially after this year. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much.